Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Thursday, December 16th. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, storm clouds over redistricting efforts in the state. Then, social welfare programs a year in review. And we talk Emmett Till with investigative journalist Jerry Mitchell. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Controversy is brewing as civil rights organizations file a complaint with the Mississippi Ethics Commission. MPB's Desiree Frazier reports the organizations are accusing legislators of not being transparent in the redistricting process. Civil rights groups, including the Mississippi NAACP, contend the Joint Legislative Redistricting Committee is not abiding by the Open Meetings Act. Yesterday, the committee approved a proposed plan for congressional seats. Lawmakers say the 2020 census shows District 2's population declined by 9 percent, or about 6,000 people. The proposal extends the district, comprised mostly of counties in the Delta, from Tunica County South to the Louisiana Line, adding four southwestern counties. Corey Wiggins is with the state NAACP. The redistricting process has not been an open and transparent process. Part of what we've been trying to do is to not only engage communities, but engage the committee in a way that allows for more engagement, more transparency, more voices of citizens in this process. The NAACP proposed a plan that Wiggins says would have added a portion of Hines and southern Madison counties to District 2. Instead, those areas remain in District 3. Republican Representative Dan Eubanks of Walls is on the Joint Redistricting Committee. He says District 2 is a major minority district. He thinks it's a good plan overall. And one of the problems you always have to deal with, especially in a minority-majority district, is you know, you're not allowed to dilute it, and you have to remain contiguous with the existing district. So this plan takes that into account and keeps everybody kind of held even. Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hoseman released a statement saying nine meetings were held statewide and webcasted. The NAACP says the meetings were held before the 2020 census data was available to analyze and use in discussions with lawmakers. Desiree Frazier, MPB News. Coming up, families with low incomes were offered a lot more government aid in 2021, but not all of them could get their hands on it. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. On paper, families in need have access to a lot more government aid than they did before the pandemic. That's especially important in the Gulf South, which has some of the highest poverty rates in the nation. But restrictive welfare policies keep many people living beneath the poverty line from accessing their programs, these programs. Stephen Basaha of the Gulf States Newsroom has more. First, let's talk about SNAP best known as food stamps. In theory, the amount the program gave people to spend on food went up 25% in October. Mine's actually went down. (laughs) Your snap went down? My snap went down because of the job that I had gotten. Ashanti Mundy lives in Guntown, Mississippi. She works at McDonald's, which recently raised her pay to $11 an hour. But because she makes more money, she now gets less from snap. The idea is to wean people off the program. The government sees that, hey, okay, I see that you're doing better. Now you will have to get knocked down some, and that's true. Monday took one step forward with her raise, 
but the loss of those SNAP benefits means she also took one, maybe two steps back. This is why it's so hard for states to address poverty. It helps. Don't get me wrong. It helps. But in all, it's still keeping you stagnated. She still relies on the food pantry to get enough food for the month. Another program that got a boost this year is TANF, or Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. It provides cash assistance for families living in poverty, and in May, Mississippi increased how much people in that program receive. But the bump in resources left a lot of advocates unimpressed. After the increase, Mississippi moved from last in the nation for how much it pays out in TANF to being fourth from the bottom, ahead of just Alabama, Louisiana, and Arkansas. The update also does not address what experts identify as the program's other big problem, really restrictive requirements that act like barriers. Or sort of maybe think of them as landmines. Matt Williams is the head of research at the Mississippi Low Income Child Care Initiative. Let's say you have an appointment regarding your drug testing requirement and something happened that day with your transportation and you couldn't get there. All of a sudden, what you are is non-compliant. That label could cause you to lose other benefits like SNAP. This is why so few people use TANF. In 2019, less than 1% of people living below the poverty line in Mississippi actually received TANF. In fact, the number of adults receiving cash assistance in Mississippi dropped during the pandemic. Now, there is a program designed to avoid these roadblocks, the child tax credit. Since July, the IRS has been sending families hundreds of dollars each month for each kid they have. That should include Kristen Murphy in Rosedale, Mississippi, but she hasn't received anything. She's taking care of her son alone, but her former partner claimed their son on his taxes. It would be nice if I got the child tax credit. That would be beautiful. I can actually buy a new bed for my kid. You know, I can get him what he needs. He can have clothes. Murphy's reached out to the IRS to get it straightened out, but the person she got in touch with said Murphy's paperwork has not been looked at yet. My taxes are just sitting there in an envelope. And then she's like, there's like 60000 in Mississippi alone that still are backlogged on their taxes. Murphy says she could really use that money. For Thanksgiving, her guests had to bring their own food because she didn't have anything to cook. My mama always told me good things come to those that wait. So she's always been right. Eventually, what I'm supposed to get for my son, he'll have. It's just waiting. That's the struggling part. Welfare reform advocates praise the child tax credit for helping to reduce the number of kids living in poverty. But even limited restrictions can keep people from getting the help that they need. For the Gulf States Newsroom, I'm Stephen Basaha. The Gulf States Newsroom is a collaboration between public radio stations in Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Coming up, we talk Emmett Till with investigative journalist Jerry Mitchell. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. The U.S. Justice Department ended its investigation into the murder of Emmett Till last week without filing any further charges. The case was reopened in 2017 after a writer named Timothy Tyson claimed in a book that a key witness in the case had admitted to him she'd lied under oath. Jerry Mitchell is a Mississippi-based investigative journalist and the author of a book about civil rights-era cold cases called Race Against Time. He joins us to offer his perspective on the Till case and to share the story of his own run-in with Tim Tyson. Carolyn Bryant gave an entirely different story to her defense lawyer, to her husband's defense lawyer. And the story went like this. Emma Till came in the store to buy, you know, candy gum. He grabbed my hand, asked for a date, said goodbye, walked out the door and whistled at me. That was essentially her story. When she testified, she she basically it was a sexual assault, essentially all but raped, you know, kind of story, which obviously is a lot different, and obviously was in the context of, you know, uh, both her lawyer, uh, her husband's lawyer, and her wanting 
see her husband get off. So it's within that context of obviously trying to get him acquitted. Uh, so that the story changed. And, and so I felt like she was lying. I mean, to be honest, uh, when she testified for that reason. I met with Tim Tyson. He had told me he was going to interview her, and I congratulated him on, you know, landing that interview. I'm like, wow, great, you know. And then he came back to me and told me he had talked to her, and uh, basically she'd stuck to, I asked if she'd stuck to her story, and he said yes. And I said, well, you know, her testimony I was talking about, well, you know she's lying, don't you? And he had no idea. He had already sure. spoken to her? Yeah, he'd already interviewed her did when he, I talked to him. Did he interview her again? That's what I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know if he talked to her again. But now the problem is this. He's telling me, he's saying that the interview, when I talked to him later, the interview took place in, in July of 2008. There were two interviews. One was in July 2008. The other was in September of 2008. And he insists that the reason this isn't in the tape transcript, which he has a transcript, I haven't seen it, but he has one. But uh, he told me the reason it wasn't in the tape transcript was because it happened before he got the tape recorder going. You also have his notes, don't you? What he wrote down, what yes. she said. And is that different yes. from what he put in the book? It differs slightly from the longer quote that he had online at one point. Uh, I think there's maybe a sense that's missing or something like that. But the thing that struck me as so odd about the notes, even assuming the notes, there's no issue there. You, when you take, you, you you would have down more than the bombshell quote, if that makes any sense. You would, you might notate the day. You might notate somebody's gesture. At least this is me. I, I would do it that way. I would write down what, you know, maybe they Maybe they nod their head or made some gesture as they made the comment. And or so write down note that. Or write down more of what they said. There, there had to be more exactly. to the conversation than exactly. Than that. There had to be more to the conversation. And I, me myself, even when I tape record, I take notes. Me, you know, a it's a backup. Sure. <laughs> in case sure. the recording doesn't work. <laughs> And B, uh, you, it, it, it kind of gives you an outline of, of your interview. And, I, and, and you write down a zillion other things. I mean, maybe, uh, you know, like I noted, it, like he mentioned his book about her having uh, eating pound cake. Well, that would be something you'd write down maybe. You know what I mean? I mean, that was uh, served in pound cake, I think. So that would be the kind of thing you might need to write down. I mean. All these things are details you you want to make sure you remember later because you, you might not. How long was the quote associated with Carolyn Bryant before the investigation was concluded and the case was closed? Uh, he had that interview uh, in 2008. Uh, the case was closed in 2021, so that's 13 years. But the book didn't come out until 2017? Yeah, nine years between when he got that quote and when the book came out. And that just strikes me as odd, aside from the part of why wait. I, I, I think, as to me, as a journalist especially, you wouldn't hold on to that. Also, didn't a family member of her of hers dispute what Tim Tyson said, she said? Yeah, she said she was there. Marsha Bryant told me she was the daughter-in-law. She said, I was there for the entire, like both interviews. And she never said anything like that. Do you think there's anything left to explore about this case? There's plenty left to explore. I don't know if there's it'll ever wind up in a trial again. I mean, I, I, I think the odds of that are, are pretty steep odds against it. Jerry Mitchell is the founder of the Mississippi Center for Investigative Reporting and the author of Race Against Time. Jerry, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts about this. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio.
Hi, my name is Rob Lane. I'm the executive producer of Mississippi Edition. Perhaps you've already heard, but Karen Brown is retiring. Today is her final time hosting the show. It should be noted that Karen is the only host Mississippi Edition has ever had. Since she first joined MPB almost 14 years ago, Karen has conducted thousands of interviews and anchored more than 3,000 live broadcasts. She's established herself as the voice of public radio in Mississippi and earned the respect of colleagues, newsmakers, and listeners alike. Jason Klein is MPB's program director. He saw Karen's brilliance early on. In fact, he was part of the committee that hired her. She walked in. Her presence when she walked in, the way she spoke, the way she held out her hand to everybody was just awesome. She owned the room when she walked in. What I remember about her was her energy and enthusiasm for the job. Teresa Collier is news director for MPB. We wanted someone who could come in and really engage with our statewide audience and to really help us to cover and examine some of the most pressing issues in the state. And so we brought her on, and um, to this day, I think um, I don't think we regret that decision. Karen started out as Morning Edition host, a role she, of course, still occupies. She was tapped to host Mississippi Edition shortly after she arrived when the agency first decided to launch a daily news program. Karen led the show to early success and, even more importantly, helped avoid early disaster. I had uh, rarely in my life seen greater radio prowess than that day. It was the first day of Mississippi Edition. This was a big deal. This was going to be the new flagship of MPB. Karen goes on. Everything's planned. This show literally had been planned for months. John Grisham was in the can. And nothing worked. None of the audio worked. Karen had to riff for almost 30 minutes straight. It was a catastrophe. And also, we learned that day that we were never going to have to worry if something went wrong. Karen could cover her all by herself. By the time former producer Ezra Wall joined Mississippi Edition, the show and its host were already in full stride. It was like walking into an environment where, okay... Now, this is how the real professionals do it. Like, th there was never any fighting about who works for whom or, you know, who's in charge or who does what. It was very much like, w you know, we are building this thing together and we're working on it together. It was always a team and, uh, and I loved every minute of it. Ronnie Agnew took over as MPB's executive director in 2010. I remember when I first walked in the building and I heard this great voice on radio. And I was like, ah, one of those days I got to go back there and meet this person. And I was walking around and looking for the person and looking for the person. And, and she was sitting right there. You know, she's just so understated. She's just so kind and friendly. And we probably ended up talking about children or something else that was off topic. But I went, I think I went to Teresa Collier, the news director, and I said, by the way, who is that sitting in the, in the newsroom? She said, well, that's Karen Brown. I was like, whoa. And that's the reaction you get from Karen. She's um, she's just a consummate pro. She doesn't take herself too seriously. But what she does not know is how much of an impact that she has made on, on not only Mississippi public broadcasting, but the citizens of Mississippi. When they hear that very distinguishable voice. Oh, yeah. The voice. It was always very warm. It was relatable. It was cozy listening to Karen. Because that was a voice I was familiar with, a voice that I felt comfortable hearing. I thought Karen always took the care and the concern and the compassion when she was interviewing people. She's the one who sets the tone because all the other reporters kind of follow that tone. During severe weather or during an election night coverage, for example, we're getting reports and we're getting information from various sources. 
people talking to her in her ear, from handing her notes, but she takes it all, she digests it, and she presents it to Mississippians in a calm, meaningful way where they can understand it. Smooth, professional, commanding. Michael Guidry produced Mississippi Edition on Election Day in 2020. And then to turn around in the morning, it was my first time doing, like, you know, post-election coverage. She took it and she made it work. Um, and I was that I was certainly in awe of her, the way she was able to engage both our analysts to be mindful of me in her ear. I mean, it was just a master class in, in, in hosting a show like that. I think uh, the listeners of Mississippi Edition, uh, the listeners of Morning Edition on MPB Think Radio will will remember Karen's on air poise. But what I regret is that none of them got to experience just her care for all of us. She had this uncanny way of remembering things about your family. How is your husband? How are things going? She would remember details of, of, you know, my family lived 1,100 miles away from here, and yet she would remember, oh, you said your brother was graduating high school. How did that go? Or when I'd come back from family vacation, you know, she would remember the names of my nieces and nephews. When the pandemic hit and kind of the everyday work structure changed with everyone working remotely and staying from home, the time that I had pre and post show with with Karen was a vital part of just kind of like my personal well-being uh, and having having someone that you can come to work and, and, and talk to and even if it's just about little things um, it was meaningful um, <laughs> I love Karen she's awesome she is is, is Man, that's somebody you go to war with. I mean, that's somebody you want sitting right by you. You know, she is awesome. She's she is, you know, brother. I mean, she is family. You know, that's that's Karen for me. Now, for the final time, as host of Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio, here's Karen Brown. Well, I didn't know that was going to happen, so I'm a little emotional. I can confirm that I'll be retiring at the end of the month, and this is the last time I'll be hosting Mississippi Edition. What an honor it's been. In my 14 years hosting this show, I've talked with two U.S. presidents, six Mississippi governors, many U.S. congresspeople, and countless Mississippi Senate and House members. But my favorite conversations have been with everyday Mississippians who love this state as much as they're leading their charge to improve it with better health care, food for children, better schools, and many other issues that need attention. Thank you. I'm glad we got to know each other. I've had the honor of working with the best news team. Rob Lane has been a phenomenal producer of this show. He makes Mississippi Edition what it is, and he's not going anywhere. Special thanks to our news team leader, uh, Teresa Collier, and managing editor, Michael Guidry, who's sitting right across from me now. Uh, Desiree Frazier and Kobe Vance are two reporters who work long hours to make sure they can offer relevant stories about Mississippi. They continue to impress me every day, as does our newest reporter, Brittany Brown, who covers criminal justice. I thank all of you for listening. Keep listening because Mississippi Edition will continue on 